Welcome. This is our continuing series on getting to know our faculty, and we're really fortunate to have Jake Peshman with us here today. I've known Jake, it seems like uh, Jake, forever, but uh, obviously I met you when you were a medical student here. That's correct, yeah. But um, maybe we can go back to uh, where you grew up and um, uh, and why medicine for your career. Sure. Um, so I'm from northern Illinois originally, so Milwaukee. I lived about equal driving distance between Milwaukee and Chicago, so when I was looking at medical schools. It's way less traffic to come up here than it was to drive down to Chicago, so made visits of home a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and you know, medicine. I honestly, I probably don't know because I hmm. had always talked about being a doctor for like as long as I can remember. That even my parents don't know. Wow. Wow. It was that. Is there anyone in your family in medicine? So my grandfather was a physician. He graduated from Marquette University School of Medicine in 1914. Oh, wow. So they actually that have his great. picture up in the Alumni Association over at yeah, the medical school. For people who don't know, yeah. MCW used to be Marquette School of Medicine. Yeah, right? so he, I graduated 98 years after he graduated, uh, and I never had the opportunity to meet him, but there was always pictures around things and heard great stories, and so I'm yeah. sure there was a lot of influence from that. And so what, was he a general practitioner? He, he was a general practitioner, so he did his residency which was just a year at the yeah. tuberculosis clinic that was on these Milwaukee County medical grounds. And then he wow. served in World War I as a physician for a couple of years, uh, and then came back and was a general practitioner in the Chicago area. So he used to doing little hernias and operate a little bit, and also did house calls and took care of basically oh, everything. Wow. Just, just, uh, just an amazing story yeah. in those days. Well, yeah, but they did. It's great that you both went to the same medical school. I know, kept the yeah, tradition in the family. Incredible. And I know I um, I taught for those uh, I will disclose, and it's it's probably healthy for me to do this. It's almost like a little bit of a penance that uh, I really put uh, probably more pressure on Jake to stay here for his residency, um, and that's because he was just such a spectacular medical student. But um, uh, hopefully you look back uh, back on that decision and say great decision. Uh, absolutely. Of course, it would be hard for you to say anything other than that right now on <laughs> camera. <and laughs> no, uh, it, it was absolutely the right decision. MCW wound up number top of my rank list because I couldn't I couldn't find a program that I liked better, so yeah. that made it really easy to stay. So, and then uh, I wasn't successful in uh, mm -hmm. in in swaying you towards surgical oncology. So, how did uh, trauma and acute care surgery? How obviously we have just uh, one of the world's greatest divisions of trauma and acute care surgery, and so as a result of that, um, probably one to three residents a year choose that specialty. Yeah. I mean, I think the big part was the mentorship piece <coughs> because uh, even before I met you, uh, the trauma group had already kind of taken me in as a first year medical student. So I did research yeah. with Karen Brazel, who is now uh, out west and a program director and is um, just a great mentor and did research with her and got me involved in trauma. And so then it just kind of stuck. So yeah. um, I've chose that as a career and great career choice and great place to practice. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. So w what do you think about, I, I know that the, the Division of Trauma and, and ACS is really trying to mil make Milwaukee um, a better place. Um, with, the, with all of the stress of COVID and, uh, and, and, the, and everything that has occurred in the last couple of years, the, the, the uh, violence, if you will, in the, in the city has probably ticked up, up a little bit. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give us a, a couple words on, I know the Division of Trauma and ACS is doing so much to to make Milwaukee a better place. Let's, maybe you could go there, and then we'll talk yeah. a little bit about your interest in education. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, while other things may have slowed down during COVID, trauma didn't. In fact, our numbers are up year over year for yeah. at least the five, last five to 10 years and just really a, a exponential uptick in the last couple of years. Um, you know, it it's lots of factors. It's complex, you know, trauma is also uh, complex chronic disease because we see lots of patients who come back multiple times and so as a division we've done a lot of stuff um, to partner with the community um, working with um, stop the bleed program for first responders and for you know the the lay person who sees you know unfortunately maybe around when violence occurs and how to manage bleeding um, we're working closely with the Milwaukee Police Department um, on different projects 
um, through Dr. DeMoya, and then we have the 414 Life Program, which is just fantastic, and it has community members who get out as kind of violence interrupters, and they find out basically as soon as a trauma, especially a penetrating gunshot, so a gunshot wound or a stab wound, any kind of violent trauma occurs, they're notified very early on to go and investigate what's going on in the community and try and interrupt any retaliatory violence and things yeah. like that. So, um, and the care obviously we provide here is, you know, Amazing. Top top notch, you yeah. Know, top a, top in the we've country. We've had a couple radio shows dedicated to just 414 Life and yeah. and various other interventions that uh, are trying to help the city of Milwaukee, which is uh, really just fantastic. Yeah. Um, education. Where yeah. where do you think we'll be with um, with training surgeons uh, in another in another five ten years? I mean, the, this uh, the, this first of all, this department has had such a culture of education that it's, yeah. it's amazing. It re really is amazing. I think it's, uh, it went, I th everyone is equally as impressed as, as I am when they come and visit. But yeah. what, what are the things on the horizon that, that may make it um, a little bit better, more efficient uh, mm -hmm. to, to train surgeons? Yeah, well, I think the big change in the next couple of years is we're shifting, you know, the, the question has always been what makes a competent surgeon? Because at the end of, you know, you can do a certain number of cases, you can have a certain number of experience, you can work a certain number of hours, but at the end of the day, at the end of your five or seven years of general surgery training, you should be a competent surgeon to go out and take care of people. And we do a great job at training surgeons here uh, who are far more than competent. But nationally, you know, there's still a lot of variability in that. And so the shift through, um, the Association of Program Directors in Surgery and the ACGME is to what's called the entrustable, prof uh, entrustable professional activities, which is really where we say this is something that we should be able to allow our trainees to do, uh, and they should be fully capable of doing by the time they graduate. And that is going to be how we gauge the readiness as they progress. And then from there, who knows? Because one of the questions with that concept and model of training is that, well, if somebody's fully capable of managing these diseases by the time they're a fourth year resident, do they need that fifth year of training? Or can they start working towards their subspecialty training? And especially with the shortage of surgeons that's going to be developing in the right. country in the next 10 years, getting people out to the workforce is going to have to be something we consider. So it'll be so exciting time to be part of training. Oh, absolutely. Well, our last couple minutes, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the Peshman family. Uh, um, who, who's at home on those mm -hmm. rare couple hours when you actually leave the hospital? Uh, I, get, I get more Deanna time at the home. didn't hear that, so yes. she won't, she won't uh, be watching this video. Never, so. never. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, married, so my wife Deanna, uh, she's at home right now with our kids. She's a speech and language pathologist. And then we have two, uh, two kids. My daughter Anna is seven, which is hard to believe. Uh, and then we have a son, Thomas, who's 18 months now. So they're uh, at home and getting bigger every day. Oh, that's so. great. And so um, big sister is, uh, is taking care of uh, the 18 month old. Huh? Yeah, it's nice because now she can actually do, she's wanted a sibling for many years. So um, she can now actually play with him and do things with him now. So oh, she's right. uh, enjoying that time. Because he's walking and everything. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. walking, running around. He, he's and, and as a little boy, he's probably indestructible, right? Yeah, I mean, that's my wife's full time job is to make sure he doesn't kill himself at yeah. home. So <laughs> um, that's hard enough to do with a little boy. Very different a little boy versus a little girl. So oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, Dr. Jake Peshman, thanks mm -hmm. so much. Really great to talk to you. And uh, I know everyone who watches this video will, will be thrilled to see you. And, and it's uh, it's amazing now. I, I was saying earlier today that uh, we, we don't see each other without masks. So yeah. this is the these uh, this video series is one way for everyone to get to know our faculty mm -hmm. uh, without masks. Very so true. Really neat. Jake, yep. thanks so much. Not a problem. Thanks.